want, I can hold that with you.
captain, but you can still be an overcomer. Amen. Come on, lift your hands in your living room. Lift your hands in this church, wherever you are at today. And let's pray. Father, we love you and we honor you. We thank you as we go into Memorial Day tomorrow that it is not just a day off of work. We celebrate every person that served in the armed forces, Lord God. We thank you right now, Father, that you were able to bring them home, Lord God. And for those that made the ultimate sacrifice, Father, we pray for their families tomorrow. We thank you that, Father, we are a free nation with free worship, Lord God, Father, that we can choose our free will, God, because of these men and women that sacrificed, that paid the ultimate sacrifice. So we honor you today and we thank you that tomorrow every family will gather together and pray and eat and fellowship, but under the freedom of Jesus Christ and the freedom of this nation. So we honor you and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now come on, give God a shout today. Come on, come on, come on, give your voice today. God is great. God, get all right. You may be seated. Praise God. We want to thank you, those that are on uh, Facebook today. We apologize. We have some technical difficulties. But guess what? Difficulties don't stop the gospel. Amen? Difficulties don't stop the gospel. So we did something a little special. We have a lot of people that come and they drive into the church. So I want to give a shout out to the drive-in crew that was in the parking lot. Come on, come on, come on. So... As most of you know, President Trump, thank God you give credit where credit is due, opened up houses of worship as essential. And so we allow them to come in and they're social distancing. But it is good to see some people in the church. Right, right. I'm tired of preaching to these empty seats. All right. So let's jump right into it today. Um, how many guys have been enjoying the series? How many guys have been enjoying the series? We're talking about managing the changes and transitions in life. Managing the changes and transitions in life. How many know we've been going through some changes? We've been going through some transitions. This virus has caused everything to kind of be reset. And we're going to be speaking about that in a couple of weeks. And I know it's really, really tough. There is a difference between the virus and the reaction. There is a difference between the virus and the reaction. And the reaction to the virus has caused us to be in a state of flux and a state of change. So today, we're going to give you some more points. Make sure you get your phone out. You can type in the comments. You can take some notes in your phone. But I really want to give you some of the mechanics to managing changes in your life because there will be more changes. There will be more transitions. It doesn't matter if it's from a virus, if it's from losing your job. It could be from losing a loved one. It could be all kinds of different things. But these principles that we're learning from Noah going into the ark, John, and then coming out are really going to give you a guideline to manage transition. This is what I want to tell you, and it's not going to sound right. This is the time to start a business. This is the time to do something new. This is the time to take every opportunity. Don't shrink back because things are going wrong. Don't shrink back because we have an issue in our country with this virus. Now is the time to take your territory because all things work together for good when you love God and you're called according to your purpose. So this is part three. I want everybody to yell it out loud. One, two, three. Out of the crisis, into an opportunity. Out of the crisis, into an opportunity. So we're going to look today and we're going to see how Noah is at the end of his time, Pastor Kendra, in the ark. He's coming out and there are three principles that I want to give you today that will help you come out of the crisis, Nate, and come in to an opportunity. Because let me tell you this. There is always an opportunity when there is a problem. Oh, that's good right there. There is always an opportunity to change whenever there is a problem. So watch this. When the crisis is ending, the transition is just beginning. Let's go, Luke. When the crisis is ending, the transition is just beginning. Does that make sense? Whenever the problem is ending, whenever this thing is stopping, you have a new beginning. And we say it a lot of times. When people suffer from a loss, uh, we're going to be speaking about that in a little bit. One of our members passed away yesterday, just broke my heart. But whenever somebody, whenever there's an ending, there is always a new beginning. There's a new beginning for the family. There's a new beginning for the people around them. There is always a new beginning. So you can't look at an ending and get depressed. You have to look at it and you need to feel the way that you feel. But know this, Tony, that when there's an ending, there is a new beginning. And if you focus your energy 
or the new beginning, you won't focus as much on what you lost. Ooh, that's good right there. When you focus your energy, Mike, on what's beginning, you won't focus as much as of what you lost. Now, here, this is huge. The crisis is not the transition. The crisis is not the transition. And sometimes it feels like the crisis that we're going through, Pastor George, is actually the transition. And it doesn't work that way, George. It's one, two. Number one is the problem. Number one is the crisis. But the crisis spurs the transition. So let's define transition for a moment. Transition, Pastor Jim, is when you're moving from one state or condition to the other. From one state or one condition to another. Let's say you're unemployed and you're in a transition and they call you and say, you got the job, George. So now you are in the state of transition. You'll look at it and say, oh, I lost my job and that's the transition. And that could be true. But you want to look forward, you don't want to look behind. So now when they call you and tell you, you got the job or you got the contract or I'm a brand new client, that is the transition. And now you're changing from a state of unemployment to a state of employment. Does that make sense? So the crisis is first and then the transition is second. Now, principle number one, and these three principles will change your life whether you're young or whether you're old. Number one, in a transition, God remembers you. This is so huge. In a transition, God remembers you and all the details. Then he will craft a solution to help you. That's big. God will remember you. Joe, God will remember you. So what happens is we go into the problem, Jennifer, and we're like, oh my gosh. And we always tend to think, where is God when there's a problem? God is still there. Why? Because the scripture says he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. So guess what? If he'll never leave you, Nate, or he'll never forsake you, even though it feels like because you're going through that God is gone, God is still with you. This is big. Now watch. Watch how God treats Noah. And a lot of people don't understand. It took 50 to 75 years roughly to build this ark with no Home Depot and no Lowe's. Every time they wanted a tree, they had to go cut one down. How many of you know that job sucks? That is hard to do. But then, how would you love to be in an ark in a boat with elephants, lions, bears? Come on, somebody sent me a meme this week and said, I know God didn't put those cockroaches on the boat. <laughs> he must have known, right? So how would you like to be in a boat and have to take care of those elephants? Can y'all imagine? Ain't no sleeping in. Right? The lion, ah, okay, hold up, bro, hold up. He's taking a little man to feed it from my plan. But on the boat, they had to take care of these animals, so they had to get up and imagine feeding these animals sometimes one or two times a day. So Noah has a very, very difficult job. But the Bible tells us in a moment that God remembered Noah. And let me tell you this, whether you're in the crisis right now, Josh, or whether you're moving in the transition, God remembers you and God sees you and God will never let you be by yourself. Then what God will do, and we're going to see it in the scriptures, David, God will look at your problem and he will craft a solution that solves all the different parts, Toya, of your life and of your problem. What we want God to do is stop the problem, solve it right then and there. But what God will do is he will address all these different things. For example, you're in a relationship, it doesn't go well. You're in a marriage and God forbid it is in a divorce. You'll say, okay, I want to be married again or I want a brand new person. What God will do is he will slow down. Everybody yell out, slow down. God will slow down and say, okay, I can bring you someone else but then they'll lead too, or there'll be problems too, because I gotta fix these three, these three things in you. They'll lead too, Frank, if I don't fix these things in you. So God will craft a solution to solve the bigger problem, not just the problems you and I see. So watch this, that's good. So here we go, scripture number one, Genesis chapter eight, verses one through three. Now watch this, this is important. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing. God didn't just remember Noah, he remembered who? Every living thing, even those cockroaches. God said, look at the new roaches, okay? God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him, watch this, in the ark. 
and God made a wind to pass over the earth. So watch this. The first thing that happened is God is addressing the problem. What is the problem? Too much water on the earth. So God, when he comes in and says, the first thing I'm going to do is cause a wind to get rid of the water. Watch this. Because the water is the thing stopping you from getting out of your boat. So I'm going to address it in pieces. So watch. I'm going to cause the wind to pass over the earth and the waters to subside. Verse 2. The fountains, this is big, of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped. Now let's stop for a second. First of all, the wind is blowing, George, and making the water come off of the land so it's dry. But then he says, he stopped the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven. Most people still don't realize that way back in the beginning, when God first created the earth, the temperature of the earth was 70 degrees. Why was it 70 degrees? It was perfect. Because the earth was sitting there and there was a ball of water called the firmament surrounding the earth. So people didn't die of ultraviolet poisoning because the sun would come through the water and then it would be filtered and it would hit the earth. So it was a perfect condition. When the flood happened, Pastor Dora, God broke that firmament, that ring of water, and the water rushed in down on the earth. But also there were tsunamis under the ocean. So the earth would break up and there would be huge earthquakes and they're called the fountains of the deep. So the earth got hit from above Frank and from below. The earth broke up, water gushed out, and then the water came from on top and the whole earth was in a state of flux. So when God decided to craft a solution, he said, first of all, I'll blow the water away so you can step forward. Come on, somebody. God will blow the water away. God will move the people away. God will move the problems away so you can step out and do what God is calling you to do. You can't step out when it's wet, so he'll make sure it's dry and it's stable for you to walk on. Then he said, next thing, I'm going to stop the very thing that caused the flood, John, in the first place. So he stopped the fountains of the deep, and he stopped the water from coming from heaven. And then it says, at the end of the uh, 150 days, this is huge. At the end of 150 days, the water decreased. So it took five months of the wind blowing on the water so that the water would be moved, Sean, so that they could actually get out of the boat and walk. A lot of people think, and they look at the ark, and they look at the ark as the safety. The ark was just a transition to the safety. The ark was just a transition for the new life. So you need to be looking in your life for the arks. You need to be looking for the things that God has put in your life that keep you until you can walk forward and do what God is calling you to do. Come on, give God a shout today. So, point number one, God will address your situation and he will have a solution for all the details that are happening when you're in the transition. Now, everybody say principle number two. Oh, I'm glad you said that. Here we go. In a transition, God is accomplishing, this is so big, many completions. In a transition, God is, is accomplishing many completions, and I will explain that in a minute, in us. We are looking for a big change when God is completing us in small levels. We're looking for a big change, a radical change, when God is completing us on a small level. Now, everybody say seven. So this is really, really big. Now watch this. In Genesis chapter 8, 4, 10, and 12, it says, then, now watch these verses. Genesis 8, verse 4, verse 10, verse 12, and verse 14. Now you can't make this up. I want you to see if you find something in the scriptures that is repeated. Then the ark rested in the what? Seventh month. The 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. We know where the ark is. Most people don't know the Ararat book is in Turkey. It's just frozen in some ice there. They've had a couple of explorers go and take some of the wood off of this boat that's trapped in the ice. And it was gopher wood. And they know that gopher wood is not found in Turkey. So that means this, this boat that had, was built with gopher wood floated all the way to Turkey. If God ever decides to fall that mountain out, there would be proof of the ark and it would shut down the voice of every atheist. 
but they have come. See, God always needs proof. People say, that story doesn't make sense. How can animals be in a boat? Well, there's a boat sitting on top of a mountain, and somebody tell me how it got there. It sure wasn't no helicopters. Come on, God is good. So it says, the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat, which is in Turkey, verse 10, and then Noah waited yet another what? Seven days. And again, he sent the dove out from the ark. He was trying to see, Luke, if the water was clear. So if the dove landed, then he knows he can open the ark and let the animals out. But the birds would go and come back because there was still water and no place for the birds to land. So he waited yet another seven days. And again, he sent the dove out from the ark. So he waited yet another what? Seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him anymore. What does that mean? That the first part of what God was doing, which is blowing the water out, it worked. So you need to know that when God is moving in your life, even though you still see water, that God is still moving and one day you won't. One day you won't feel the pain that you feel. One day you won't be in the difficulty that you're feeling. God is still blowing on your life and pretty soon you're going to be able to step out and do what God has called you to do. That's big. And then verse 14. And in the second month, on the 20 what? Seventh day of the month, the earth was dry. Now, let's talk about this. God is a God of numbers, right? And sometimes the devil has come in and used numerology to make it demonic. But guess what? Mathematics is based on numbers, George, and God's whole creation is based on numbers. Somebody out there tell me how long was the total process of God creating the earth and resting? How many days? Seven. Seven is not a random number. Seven literally means, let's go back to it real quick for me, Luke. Thank you. Seven actually means completion. Seven means completion. Now watch, remember what I told you. When there is a transition and when there is an issue, God will do many completions. Many completions. You're like this. I just got divorced. Where is my new husband? I just got divorced. Where is my new wife, right? And God is like, I need to do 21 things in you. Three times seven. I need to do some mini completions in you. Where is my new job? Well, you lost your old job because you was always on your phone and you wasn't working. You lost your old job because you were always late. And we couldn't, we didn't know when you were coming in. So guess what? I need to do a mini completion in you and help you be on time, help you value your time, help you value your boss's time. Guess what? My, that's a number seven. That's a mini completion. Now this is huge. It is not an accident that this whole situation with Noah is built on a bunch of sevens. God was completing, Frank, the whole entire process. And sometimes we want God to do something big when God is trying to do something little that leads to something big. God is trying to do something little that leads to something big. You and I have to learn certain things before we can go to the next step. So principle number two, in a transition, God is accomplishing sevens or many completions in us. But we're looking for the big change when God is completing little changes that are within us. Come on, give God a shout for that. Now, we're heading into the last point, and I've been so excited to get to this point. This thing revolutionized my life this week. We're going to talk about worship right now. And whether you're a worshiper, whether you're a singer, you're getting ready to hear something. I have never in 30 years of my life heard this point, Alex, is massive about worship. But I've always read the Bible and wondered this. So you have to pay attention to this. Remember last week we talked about Noah, Pastor Lou, and he had the animals come in two by two. But God told him, prepare seven of the clean animals. Y'all remember that? And we said that there's always been a sacrifice when you come out of a crisis. You'll have to sacrifice something. So listen, if you're in the point of sacrifice, don't get depressed because your sacrifice is going to lead to brand new worship. Does that make sense? That's good. Now watch this. This is huge. Godly transitions always bring back worship as a priority. Oh, this is big. Problems and godly transitions always bring back Worship, now watch this, we're going to find worship, Tony, as a priority. Now, this is big. Worship is not just singing. 
This is huge. Worship is a lifestyle. But let me tell you what worship is more than anything else. Are y'all ready? Worship is a decision. You can worship without singing. One of our members, so beloved, Pastor, I mean, David Lopez, had, was battling cancer and lost his tongue. But he could still worship. He would sit in the back with his iPad and he would, he would, he would write hallelujah. He would write praise God. Now he couldn't sing, but he could still worship. If you don't hear nothing else I say to this about to you today, please grab this. Worship is not just singing. Worship is about focus. Worship is not singing. This is huge. Worship is about focus. But focus what? Focus on him in the midst of distractions. Watch this. It is not an accident that the virus caused theaters, shopping, sports, eating out to shut down. Did God cause the virus? No. Did God allow it? Absolutely. And when he allowed it, people got back to the basics. This is heavy. I want to go out to eat too. I want to go to the movie theater too. But when I go to Target and Walmart, I bought my grandkids four bikes. It took me a couple of weeks to buy the bikes because the bikes were gone. When everybody was busy in their life, there was plenty of bikes. Now I see men, not just moms. I see men riding through the neighborhood, riding through Spring Valley Lake with their children because they're tired of watching reruns of sports. They're actually with the mom. Can I tell you something? Uh, men think all they gotta do is provide a house. And then they think the woman's job is to provide a home. But the man's job is to make sure that the house becomes a home just like the mom. And he's got to spend time with the kids as well. So what am I saying to you? All these distractions got eliminated. And when these distractions got eliminated, people refocused. Are y'all ready? Now watch this. I saw a survey this week and I couldn't believe it. But it said people are 67% happier right now than they were before the virus time. And I said, why are they 67% happier? And guess what they found out? Because they're at home more, with their family more, they've come back to the basics, they're not rushing around. They're, you can call it a quarantine, I call it godly living. You can call it a stay at home, I can call it should have kept your butt at home. Now we're connected, now we're with the people. Now this is huge. So worship actually causes focus. Now let's go to the scripture and I'm going to bring it all home. Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. Then Noah built an altar. Everybody say altar. An altar is a place that you worship. Once we come back to the church and we get everything set it out, people will be able to come back to the altar and they'll be able to worship. But watch this. When Noah got out of the ark, after the water was washed away and he could go forward, when he got out of the ark, he built an altar to the Lord. And then he took of every clean animal and of every clean bird last week, and he offered burnt offerings. He offered these sacrifices because Jesus hadn't come yet, so we still have to sacrifice for our sins. When we sacrifice for our sins, we become close to God, Mike. But this is huge. Watch this. And the Lord smelled. Everybody say smell. smell. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Now, this is massive. Please get this. And I'm going to explain it technically. God told Noah, you're going into a flood. You're going into a season you have never been in. But I got you. I will remember you. That's the whole thing about the rainbow. But now, after you come out, before you go in, I want you to take some animals so you can worship. Now, obviously, he can't worship on the ark. Oh, boy. Because if he starts a fire, the boat's going to sink. God said, once I deliver you, it is then time to refocus and look back on what I brought you through. 
Once you, God brings you out of a situation, once God brings you out of a negative season, he wants you to worship because he brought you out. Now watch this, follow me here. This is big. This is big. Go to the next one for me, Lou. So watch this. This is huge. Worship after a transition is essential. You need to worship through the transition. But can I be honest, Pastor Dewar? People get connected to God during the problem. And once they get delivered, they forget about God again. And they get distracted again. Now watch this. Worship after a transition is essential. It tells God we have learned something and will do things differently. Everybody say different. By putting and keeping him first. By putting and keeping him first. Now, let me bring it all together. This is huge today. Those of you that have been Christians a long time, how many of you guys have ever noticed, but Josh, you've ever been confused on why when somebody does a sacrifice, God always says it's a sweet smelling aroma. Whenever, watch Tony, whenever somebody sacrifices, it always says in the Bible, it was a sweet smelling aroma. Here's the revelation. This is crazy. This week. Remember I told you worship is not singing? Worship is focusing. Then I ask God, God, why are you smelling the sacrifice? Don't you see it? Why didn't you say you tasted it? Why didn't you say you felt it? Why did you smell it? Listen to this. This is crazy. Your tongue, I don't know if you know this, can only separate things into five categories. How many of y'all knew that? Watch. Five different categories. Now I want to read. I don't want to mess it up. Your tongue only knows if something is sweet, bitter, salty, sour, or spicy. Your tongue doesn't register that something is good. Your brain does. Your tongue, when you taste something, follow me, watch me call, can only separate what's in your mouth into five categories. Is it sweet? Is it salty? Is it bitter? Now watch this. God said, Mark, I don't taste the sacrifice. I smell it. He said, I use my nose. And I said, well, why would you use your nose? Now you ready? The tongue only can separate five things. Your nose can discern over a hundred different smells. Watch this. Your nose can discern over a hundred different distractions. Your tongue can only discern five. I said, God, I don't understand. He said, Mark, anytime in the Bible when people worship and sacrifice, I smell their sacrifice because worship is you picking me over the other 99. What? What? Worship is you picking me over the other 99 different things you could have been doing. Worship is not singing. Worship is choosing to put God first. Worship is choosing to put God first. And God says, so you have a choice whether to worship me or play sports, watch sports, do your thing. So I smell your sacrifice because I can discern that in this moment at the altar, you have chosen me over worrying about your bills. You have chosen me over worrying about your children. You have chosen me over worrying about your finances. You have chosen me over worrying about your problems. So I don't see your sacrifice. I don't touch your sacrifice. I don't taste your sacrifice. I smell your sacrifice because that's what worship does. It tells me you have chosen me. Come on, give Jesus a shout today. My God, my God. Come on, lift your hands. Worship is not singing. 
Worship is focus. Worship is focus. And when we worship, we tell God, you're more important in this moment than anything else. Every Sunday when we worship, or whatever day of the week you worship, God says, I smell you. I smell you. It's a sweet aroma that you turn the TV off and worship me. It's a sweet aroma that you stop watching the movie to worship me. It's a sweet aroma that you got up on Sunday when didn't think you could come to church and drove into the parking lot and now you find yourself in the house of the Lord. Because you sacrificed. This group I'm looking at sacrificed to come and do what you could have did at home. You could have watched it at home, but you came to the house of the Lord. The Bible says forsake not the assembling of yourselves and you guys came and it worked out because of a problem, a crisis technically. It worked out. God remembered you in your car and they let you in and now we've been able to worship together. You don't know how my heart feels preaching to an empty church after nine weeks. It's terrible. You don't register there's a virus as a pastor. You register all the empty seats and you have encouraged me today but you're here because of the problem we had. I thank God today for the problem that I got to see you. If you're watching us, you're gonna be watching us on the video later. We love you so much and we honor you. Some of you are watching on Facebook now. Come on, lift your hands. Father, we are determined to worship through our transition. Father, we are determined that this problem, whatever it is in our life, is not gonna stop us that this problem is going to keep us in perfect peace. Father, we thank you today that you remember us. We thank you that you're doing many completions in us. But Father, when we're through with this situation, when we're through with this season, we're going to remember it's time to build an altar and worship you. And we're going to focus back on you once all the regulations are lifted. Father, don't let us go back to business as usual. That's not why you allowed it. Let us make sure we put you first. In Jesus' name, amen. Now come on, give God a shout today. Come on, come on, come on. God is great today. Never forget, so powerful, Frank. Worship is not singing. Worship is focus. If you're here today and you're watching us on Facebook or you're even watching later today on the video, you must be born again. The most important thing you can choose the most important thing you can choose is to make your reservation before you have to transition from this earth into eternity. I lost one of my uh, real dear friends yesterday and I'm still, I, I still really don't know where to put it. Um, I moved to California in 1997, but before California, I lived in Michigan and I used to do a lot of outreach to gangbangers, to Crips, and to Bloods, and we would go into the neighborhoods, me and my oldest son, we barbecue, George, we feed him, and I mean, there was one neighborhood of Bloods, one neighborhood of Crips. So God really blessed me, and I applied for, I'll never forget it, my first grant was $13,180, and I applied for a grant, and I got this funding, Dora, and I called out to California, and I called this group called the Gospel Gangsters. I had never heard of them, and they were in the beginning of Christian rap. And I said, hey, can you guys, I heard your story, can you guys come out, <coughs> excuse me, and help me? And they were a mixture of Crips and Bloods. They said, we'll come out. So we flew over to Michigan. We did three nights, Frank, in three of the worst neighborhoods in Ypsilanti, Michigan. And they were killing each other. And we brought the gospel gangsters out. They did these rap concerts. And all these gangbangers, you should have seen them, were laid out on the ground, praising God. All these gangsters were lifting their hands. They were throwing their guns away. And all the gang banging in that season, it completely stopped because God shut it down because of this group. One of the leaders of this group, Charles Washington, some of you know him as Solo. He came to church, he was sitting right there. He, he's young and yesterday, well Friday night, 40 years old, just passed away, came through the door. His mom saw him, he was laid out on the sidewalk. And she says, son, what's wrong? He said, mom, I can't breathe. Completely healthy, strong, and guess what? He left this earth in her arms. Now, thank God she came out of the house and was able to hold her son. But we want to pray for them this morning. But my heart is devastated. But this one thing I know, Charles 
AKA Solo, is in heaven with his heavenly father. And he is gone too soon. And we're praying for his children. He's got four kids. But he made his reservation before he had to leave. Who's thinking about passing away, walking out of their door? I don't think about it. I think I'm coming back. I, I think everything in my house is going to see me again. I think my children are going to see me again. And I knew him before anyone else in California. So my heart is just devastated today. But I am encouraged that he made his reservation and made Jesus Christ his Lord and Savior before he had to leave unexpectedly. And you need to do the same thing. Wherever you are today, lift your hands. You need to make a commitment today that the, that the Lord Jesus Christ can come and live in your heart. So if you were to pass away unexpectedly, you would immediately be in the presence of the Lord. The Bible says to be absent in your body is to be present with the Lord. When you are a Christian and you are a believer, the minute you take your last breath, God brings you home and hugs you. And the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It's hard for us that are left behind. But for God, he gets to bring you home. So I want to pray for you, then I want to pray for Charles' family. So lift your hand today and repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I have been distracted most of my life. But today, I feel your presence. Most importantly, I feel your love. Lord Jesus, I know that you are in me. And if I were to die, I would be in heaven with you. Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. When I die, receive me into your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Now come on, give Jesus a shout today. If you are watching via Facebook and you made a decision for Christ, you want to let us know, you want to type that in, and we will call and we will pray for you. It's so important that we follow up with you and we're able to see you again. And we want to make sure that if you were to transition out of this earth, that we would see you again. Come on, give Jesus a hand clap. Come on, God is great. Amen. I hope you are enjoying the series. How many of y'all are enjoying the series? Managing change and transition by looking at the life of Lord. I'm so, so thankful. Right now, you have an opportunity to give. Amen. I know some of you are here. And if you have your offering envelope, you were going to hold it outside of your door now. We're going to have our ushers come back there, Mike, with a bucket. And you can sow your seed uh, into the kingdom of God. If you are online, you can give. You can go down there. There are four different ways to give. You can see it at the bottom of the screen. And you can go online, go on abundantlivinghd.com. You can make a reoccurring giving. So many of you, because you haven't been able to come, have done reoccurring giving. And it's really, really helpful helped our church to survive. Imagine not being able to come to church for nine weeks. Think about what that does to your finances. It's, it's a crazy thing, but God is being faithful through you, through your giving. Remember this, and this kind of came to me yesterday. You will never make enough money to take care of God's plan for your life. Listen again. You will never make enough money to take care of God's plan for your life. Now, you can make enough money made to take care of your plan. And that's even hard to do. But your money is a seed. And the seed gives you a 30, 60, or 100-fold return. Anytime you give to the church or you give to the kingdom of God, really you're giving to God. You set off a harvest, and that harvest is more than the seed. You can plant one seed in the ground that's an apple, and it'll give you, Brooke, 105 apples on the tree when it grows. But each apple has 12 seeds in it. So one seed can cause 105 apples, Judy, and each apple has 12 seeds. When you give your offering and you give 10%, you give your tithe, you are setting off an offering that cannot be matched by what you gave. This is the whole reason Vegas exists. People want to pull the lever and they want to put in a quarter, but they want to get hundreds of dollars. In the kingdom of God, you don't have to pull it and get the press because every time God will remember your seed. So come on, hold your offering up wherever you're at. Let's pray over your seed. Father, I thank you for their giving today. I thank you for their sacrifice today. Father, giving is also a type of worship. So we are so thankful today, Father, that you are with us and we have it to give. Now multiply it back. Father, start businesses, Father. We bring more clients, Lord Jesus, Father. Every seed that goes in the ground in this famine. The Bible says Isaac sowed in the time of famine. And reap the 150-fold return, God. I thank you that everything everybody is giving during this tough season, that they will reap 
fold return, Father. We love you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, give God a shout. So make sure you click that button, make sure you give, and continue being faithful to God. Amen? All right, we have a couple of announcements. Can we put them up for me there? Can I see them, Brooke, back here or no? Okay, there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, all the people that are here today, I want you to give a hand clap to our technical team. This is a difficult thing to do. When we were in church, the next week we have to go live. And sometimes things happen. But all of them together today, we're able to record it, just make it possible. I want to thank you, Nate, for making sure we got on Facebook. So I really appreciate our technical team. And we thank God for their wisdom and their ability to press through. All right. We're going to start something brand new. I know Mr. Frank, he loves this. We're going to start our Park and Pray this Wednesday. So from now on, until we come back, uh, we're going to be out in the uh, parking lot, and we're going to do park and pray. You're going to be able to pull up. You can pull your chair out, but you got to stay by your car because we're going to make sure that we're social distancing. But it's going to be at 630, and I want you to join us as we do a collective prayer. The Bible says, if my people, which are called by my name, if they will humble themselves, and if they will pray, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. How many of you know we need our land healed? So the church has to pray. Toya, one pastor just did a parking lot prayer. He said, I just want to open up the parking lot. 600 people came. The next week, 1,600 people came. How many of you know people are hungry, people are desperate, and people are fearful, but we're going to take back this high desert, and we're going to be stronger when we leave this thing. So I'll see you this Wednesday at 630 for Park and Pray, and then we're going to have our refuel right after that. So instead of it just being live, I'm going to be outside. I'll be able to see you. We're going to have our um, refuel midweek service. It's going to be at 7 o'clock. So we're going to pray from 6.30 to 7. And then I'm going to preach a 15-minute message. And we'll be able to interact with one another on this Wednesday. And we'll do that for the next following Wednesdays. Amen? That's going to be good. So I'll see you this Wednesday at 6.30. Now, we're looking for volunteers uh, for our media. We're expanding our digital campus. So if you have a gifting with Instagram, Facebook, uh, you want to help us do page management, our YouTube content, we just want to make sure we keep this thing going and keep it going. So you can email Pastor Lou at AbundantLivingHD.com, Pastor Lou at AbundantLivingHD.com, and I'm really looking for young people as well. If you want to help us post on Instagram and do all these things, we want to get the gospel out and keep it out in social media, but we want to grow that, amen, from this opportunity. And then finally, we have our Meals That Heal um, Hygiene and Food Program. I'm so excited, you guys. A lot of you guys, you've been coming and driving in church, so hopefully you got an outline today. You also, if you're watching us, you can go on AbundantLivingHD.com under the resource tab, and you're going to be able to download this list of food items. Let me tell you what we're doing, Tony. You're going to love this. How many of you guys know we do our prison program, people getting out of jail and prison, we transport them and we help them, right, Nicole? We've transported 13,000 people from jail. How many of you know that's huge? But we don't want to just transport them. We want to get them jobs and we want to house them. So we have now a partnership with another pastor in Lido Creek, and I'm so thankful for Pastor John. He's got two houses for women, five houses for men. Listen to this, 62 beds for people. So we, we utilize him, Josh, when people get out of jail and don't have a place to go. So I told him, I said, okay, our church got you. We're going to resurrect our Meals That Heal program, and once a month, I'm going to have everybody bring food and hygiene products, because guess what it does, Joe? It saves him money from buying food, and he can continue to help the people. How many of y'all think Abundant Living Family Church can step up to the plate? Amen. So, you'll be able to download that list. Some of you got the list next Sunday from 1130 to 1230. We'll be in the parking lot. George and Jennifer are going to be handling that. You just pull up, drop off your food, and you can keep going. And we're going to make sure once a month these homes have enough food to take care of people that need a second chance. Can we do it? Come on, can we do it? I think we can do it. Amen. All right, I want to thank you today. I want to thank you for logging in and being patient with us on Facebook. You're going to be able to see this a little bit later today on AbundantLivingHD.com. I want to thank my drive-in church that got to sit in. Woo-hoo! Appreciate you. Come on, lift your hands. Father, we love you, 
and we honor you. We thank you, God, that June the 7th, we will be back in the house of the Lord in our two services at 10 and 1230. We're thankful, God, that we are just weeks away of seeing one another again. So we honor you, Father, and we thank you that just like Noah, you remembered us, and we are coming out. We love you, and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, give God a shout. You're dismissed today.